Um, right, I'm here to talk about Ladybird, and uh, let's see how to do that. That's how you do that. Okay, hi. Uh, I'm Andreas Kling. I've been in the browser industry for a long time, since 2006, as uh, she mentioned. Um, made my way through various projects and companies. And nowadays, since 2019, um, we are working on a new novel engine, um, which I'm here to talk about. So let me give you a very quick high-level overview. Uh, Ladybird is a full-stack browser and engine. So we don't take any code from existing projects. Um, it's our own JavaScript engine, our own CSS implementation, everything, everything uh, from scratch. And it's permissibly licensed under a two-clause BSD license. So if anybody sees anything they like and they want to use it for something, just go ahead. Uh, do whatever you want. Um, you know, just keep the license thing at the top. Uh, and uh, it's written in modern C++, which is uh, perhaps not the language I would have chosen today, but um, the sec next point explains what happened. So it's part of the greater Serenity OS project, which is uh, an operating system I started building in 2018 uh, as kind of a hobby personal therapy project after I completed a uh, drug rehab program. And I just wanted something to pass the time. And then it accidentally became a huge project, um, including a, a web browser. So um, that's sort of where it came from. Uh, but today, we have the cross-platform um, browser component, which sort of spawned out of Serenity OS. And it runs on Serenity OS, of course, but also on Linux, Mac OS, and almost any other Unix-like system can run it with a handful of uh, tweaks. Uh, it doesn't run on Windows yet. Every now and then, somebody shows up and says they're going to make it run on Windows. Nobody has taken it all the way, but one day, uh, somebody will. Uh, the project goals for Ladybird, um, it's tricky because everybody who works on a project like this, they come with their own goals and their own dreams and desires. Um, but my personal goals are that it wants to render the live web with an acceptable level of stability, security, and performance. So basically be like a, a, a usable browser on the desktop, and maybe even on mobile, uh, that can display the web. like the real web, not just um, test pages at home, but like download stuff and show you. Um, and uh, we also want to advance the web platform by being good citizens and filing spec bugs, um, fixing spec stuff that we think we know how to fix, and uh, writing tests uh, when that's necessary, uh, and also filing bugs against other browsers, because uh, one of the things that we end up doing a lot is just testing um, what happens if I load this test in another browser? What do they do? And then sometimes we discover uh, inconsistencies. And we want to be you know, good boys and girls and file issues about that. Um, and like the Servo folks mentioned, we want to add engine diversity to the market as well. Uh, I think we are living in a slightly sad time where big companies like Microsoft uh, and Opera just kind of give up on building their own engines. and. It's up to hackers like us to uh, make new ones. Um, and of course, the fourth and arguably the most important goal is to have fun, um, which we are having just so much of because this is off the hook. All right, uh, <laughs> next up, let me just give you a quick overview of the timeline of, of um, what happened. So in June of 2019, I was just working on Serenity OS uh, with its little GUI, and I was thinking, you know, it would be nice to have a rich text display widget, so I could display not just like one single font of text, but maybe like bold sometimes, or different font sizes. And I thought, well, what would be a good internal representation for rich text? Maybe HTML. So I uh, made a simple thing for that. <laughs> um, and uh, it was fun to hack on, so I kept doing it, and kept adding like little things that uh, eventually, you could kind of tell that, OK, this is maybe more than a, just a rich text widget. So in October of the same year, uh, I added a browser application. So like a simple GUI app called Browser. So it was now actually a browser. Um, but, but even then, I was still thinking, oh, this is for like displaying local HTML files and documentation and stuff like that. We're probably not going to do JavaScript. And of course, in March, 
um, I decided to do JavaScript. So um, I made a, a video actually on YouTube of just starting a JavaScript engine from scratch. And a lot of people watched that. And some people thought, hey, wait a minute. I, I can do this. Uh, so they started helping out. And because of that, it accelerated super fast. And we got the, um, like the initial implementation of JavaScript went way faster than I expected. Um, People added all kinds of like different um, operations and uh, the runtime uh, functionality needed. And then somebody came and wrote a parser, which made the whole thing take off really well. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> three months after that, I thought, you know, it's pretty annoying that this thing uh, keeps crashing like the whole window when I just have some bug in a page. So we should probably be multi-process. So I did that as well. Um, that's still the architecture we have today. Sort of, it's a process per tab. It's not the most mature architecture, but um, it's where we're at. And then after that was like a big two-year uh, gap where we didn't really have any huge milestones, but rather just incremental uh, improvement, um, tons and tons of small milestones and medium milestones, but nothing big and juicy until uh, July in 2022 when um, I added a cross-platform version um, with a cute GUI. And what happened there was that um, this whole time, until then, we could only run on Serenity OS. So we were kind of confined to running inside of um, a virtual machine, running on our own operating system. Uh, and then at the, in, in the start of 2022, um, somebody named Dex went and did the grunt work of uh, making a Linux port of, of the web stack. And um, then I built on top of that to, to make a, an actual GUI for the browser. And that is what is the Ladybird cross-platform thing today. Anyways, that's the rough timeline, just to give you an idea. Let's talk about the current state of Ladybird. So um, Delan mentioned acid tests. So this is us on the acid tests. <laughs> We're doing pretty OK. Um, <laughs> now, I'm cheating a little bit here because um, they're pretty small pictures, so you can't see. There's a little uh, deformity on the Acid 2 man's chin. He has like, a slice of red. Uh, it's not so important. <laughs> um, and also, there's a little uh, flakiness on Acid 3, just to be totally honest. Sometimes you have to reload the page to get a full 100. Uh, <laughs> but we'll figure that out eventually. <laughs> now. Uh, the acid tests are, of course, they're pretty old, right? I think acid three was last updated in 2011 or 2010, something like that. Um, so we are making progress on modern sites as well, such as the site for this event, um, <laughs> which we recently spent uh, two days just making work. Uh, so I could have this slide. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so we have a, a decently mature uh, Flexbox and um, less mature, but, but up and coming grid. Uh, layout implementation, and we keep improving and improving uh, by just taking live websites and trying to get them to work and, and look good. Uh, but many bugs remain, of course. Um, this is very often what you would end up seeing. Like it kind of loads, you can recognize the page, but there's something like a little a goof, um, and many pages don't load at all. Um, I don't know why I chose this specific example, but many bugs remain, and we are working on that. Um, so I said I would also give a brief overview of the architecture of Ladybird. So let's do that. Um, here is the rough idea. So um, there's a process boundary, as you can see. Uh, on top, we have sort of the UI, the GUI process, which is the thing you interact with, with your mouse or touchpad. Um, and uh, we have two separate GUI applications, one written for Serenity OS and one written for Qt. This is um, not ideal, and we would love to have a single application. It's just uh, the way things are right now. Um, they are written in slightly different ways, so we can't share the code yet. Um, anyway, those two things are fairly, fairly small. It's like less than 4,000 lines, I think, in the, in the applications. Everything else is shared. So we have libwebview, which provides a web view. And then on the other side of the process boundary, we speak via an IPC link to a web content process, which is sort of the, the rendering process. And it has all of these cool libraries inside of it. 
And all of them are homegrown uh, from the Serenity OS project. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our different libraries. So we have libjs, uh, which is our implementation of ECMAScript, language and runtime. And it also has a garbage collector, of course, because you need one for JavaScript. Um, execution is done with a simple AST tree walk interpreter. So it is very slow. Um, and it has all of the typical like AST tree walk interpreter problems, like you can run out of stack uh, if you recurse too deep and stuff like that. So we are working on a bytecode VM, but it's not as good as the AST version just yet. Um, the whole libjs is almost entirely unoptimized. So for anybody who's interested in optimizing JavaScript engines, there is a tree here with like all low-hanging fruit. Uh, just saying. <laughs> uh, and we also have libweb, which implements most of the web platform stuff. So DOM, HTML, CSS, SVG, um, fetch, XHR, um, other stuff like sub-resource integrity or UI events, like any kind of web spec, it usually just goes into libweb. Um, and it's also responsible for layout, painting, and hit testing. Maybe I should have put event handling on this slide. Um, but it, yeah, it, it does kind of what you would think it does. It implements the web platform. Um, and then we have all these other libraries. So um, I'm not necessarily going to talk in depth about any of them, just to give you an idea of um, all of the different components we have, because we make all these things ourselves. And uh, all of this stuff is in our repository. It's all part of a monorepo. Uh, and these components are used not only in our browser, but also in the Serenity OS operating system. So um, they have sort of a dual purpose in that sense. Um, all right. Next, I guess I wanted to give you just a quick look at the um, class hierarchy that we're working with, because at least this is something I always look at when I want to look at another browser engine and see how they do stuff. I'm always curious, like, what is a DOM node in your engine? Uh, in our engine, it is a uh, JS cell uh, at, at the root. Uh, so a JS cell is just a single smallest unit that you can ask uh, the garbage collector for. So it's a just garbage collected object. And then what you see there is sort of, if you're familiar with the web specs, you would recognize that inheritance diagram. We've modeled kind of the exact diagram from, from, uh, from the IDL. And uh, this is a theme in our engines, by the way. We try to model the specs as closely as possible uh, for multiple reasons. But um, my favorite one being that it just makes the code so much more maintainable and approachable for new people. Because um, if somebody comes to us and they've never looked at our code, but they're familiar with the specs, they'll recognize everything. Because it has the same names, uh, follows the same flow, everything. Even the variables and function names are the same as the spec. Um, but uh, right, so last thing I wanted to mention here, we, as you can see, we do garbage collect our um, DOM. And this is something when I worked on WebKit back in the day that always irritated me, that um, they have this dual setup where you have reference counting and garbage collection. And um, sometimes objects with one ownership model owns objects with the other ownership model. And it's just a big mess. And I always wanted to change that in WebKit, but I never had the energy to go through with it. But here, I did. And it was a like, great personal achievement. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that was a little nerdy. Um, let's look at the next slide. So this is our very high-level rough rendering pipeline. For anybody who's familiar with browsers, you probably know this stuff already. But um, just a quick overview, we combine the HTML DOM and the CSS OM into per-element computed style. Uh, and then we uh, build a layout tree out of that, or a box tree, as they call it in the CSS specs. And then the layout tree is what we run the layout algorithms on, which produces a paint tree. And the paint tree is just the final thing that you can draw into a bitmap or a window or on, onto a printer page one day, maybe. Um, so the final state of, of this machine is like a tree that has just absolute coordinates for everything, and it's ready for painting and ready for hit testing. Um, right, this slide. Uh, our layout implementation, uh, I wanted to just talk about it briefly, because it's another thing I think is interesting. And I always look at how other engines do layout. 
Uh, ours is organized around CSS spec concepts. So we have a formatting context uh, base class and then subclasses for the block, flex, grid, table, and so on, all the different formatting contexts. And um, there's, we have a concept called available space, which maps to the same concept from the CSS sizing spec. And uh, the inputs to, to layout is typically you, you make a formatting context, and then you tell it which box to format and how much available space there is. And then it will figure out the rest. Uh, and that has made layout quite easy to work on, uh, which I'm really happy with. And we have two layout modes um, that you can run these formatting contexts in. There's normal layout, which is what we do most of the time. And then there's intrinsic sizing, when we're just trying to figure out how big is an element if it's unconstrained by context. And they're almost exactly the same. It's just that when we do intrinsic sizing, we can avoid some stuff. Like um, if something has like a um, specific size specified by CSS already, you don't necessarily need to look inside of it to figure out um, how big the children are because you're only interested in the outer size of the thing. Anyway, how do we test all this stuff? Well, for libjs, we have an in-house regression test suite, which we've been just kind of been accumulating since we started um, building the JavaScript engine. So uh, those are tests that we make for ourselves whenever we find stupid bugs and we make stupid tests. Um, but we also run test 262, so we have a test runner for that. And uh, we run those on every push to our master branch. So we track them in a graph. and. Uh, the graph has been hugely successful. It uh, made a lot of people really interested in improving the graph. So looking forward to adding more graphs, by the way. Uh, for WASM, we have a test WASM tool, which just um, gets the WASM spec tests and run all, runs all of those. And for LibWeb, um, to be honest, we were not testing LibWeb very hard for a long time. Uh, it's only a few months ago that we added um, layout tests and text tests, which are similar to what you find in WPT. Um, just load a page, wait for the load event, and then dump either the layout tree or uh, the text content at the page. And um, we added them a couple of months ago, and we're up to like 200-something tests. So we're very, very, uh, very small still in that department. And uh, we don't yet run web platform tests. We have a runner under construction actively under construction. Um, Alex, who's also here, um, he has been working on getting the ref tests part of WPT up and running. And we are looking forward to getting more tests up and running. And then hopefully, we can make a graph. And then you know, people will make the graph go up. <laughs> um, quick look at upcoming work. So performance is a big issue for us. We are very slow on almost everything because we are very unoptimized. So um, that's OK, because I, um, my job at Apple was to work on the WebKit and Safari performance. So I know what we need to do. I just need to do it again. Uh, <laughs> it, but we've been kind of uh, putting that aside and, and chasing correctness instead, and just chasing functionality and, and trying to get all the pieces into place. But uh, I'm reasonably confident that we have a good enough architecture that we can put performance on top of that architecture without having to rejig everything. Um, memory safety is uh, obviously an issue for anybody using C++. Um, the approach that we are investigating right now is we are making a new language which um, transpiles to C++. And it's a new safe language. And uh, it will allow us to incrementally uh, transition to memory safety without having to deal with um, awkward boundaries between incompatible languages or, or very different languages. Um, but yeah, I, I thought for a project that already makes its own operating system and its own web browser and its own everything, what's a language, right? Like, <laughs> we can try that too. <laughs> Um, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But uh, it, it seemed worth giving it a shot. Uh, so that's about a year old, but still not integrated in the browser engine. Um, and then, of course, implementing specs, fixing bugs. That's our daily uh, bread and butter. That's what I do almost every day these days, just fixing stuff. Uh, and we're going to have to keep doing that, because although some pages look great, other pages do not. 
Um, and that's what the work is about. Finally, I really want to just give credit to all of the people who have been working on uh, Ladybird. Um, these are far from, this is far from everybody. These are just the people with 10 or more um, patches in the web or JS engines. There are hundreds of people who have contributed in one way or another. Um, and it's been absolutely great to, to be able to bring so many people into browser hacking because it is something I love to do probably something most of you love to do. And um, if we can get more people to do it, I think the future of browser hacking is looking good. Uh, so thank you to all of these people and more. And thank you for coming to my talk. And thank now you, you can Anipas. ask me anything. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so questions. Do we have questions? Thank you for the talk. Uh, it was really interesting to hear that you are starting to uh, consider putting in uh, optimizations for performance. When can we expect a optimizing compiler in libjs? <laughs> well, that's a good question. An optimizing compiler in libjs, it's something that I'm a little bit suspicious of. Um, I know it's all the rage to optimize JavaScript, and people love writing, you know, 10 tier JIT compilers and stuff. But um, I started using that uh, lockdown mode in iOS when that came out, and they turn off the JIT, and the web is just fine. So I am a little bit curious about how much can we really do without a JIT? Like, do we need a JIT? Do we need to make the security compromises, the complexity compromises that a JIT uh, forces you to make? I don't know. So. Um, from my perspective, I think I'm most interested in exploring like how far can we push an architecture that doesn't sacrifice, uh, make the sacrifices necessary for a JIT. Uh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't optimize. We should probably optimize. We need to make a bytecode interpreter and make that really fast with all the techniques and stuff. Um, but I'm curious about an uh, alternate path, not necessarily what um, production engines do today. Cool. Um, we have one question here that someone has asked. What are the other language would you have chosen for Ladybird instead? If I were building the project from scratch today, I would probably start by building a language. <laughs> 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 but, but if I had to pick one, maybe Swift. Um, I am a big fan of Swift, but I stayed at Apple for long enough to become infected, so I have a little bit of Apple brain, and Swift just looks so good to me. Um, I spent a bunch of time last year learning about Rust, and I think Rust does a lot of amazing things, a lot of cool um, tricks, and it's really good how Rust has embarrassed the language industry, uh, hopefully embarrassed even C++ enough that they will take action and then fix stuff. Um, but that remains to be seen, because the C++ does not move super fast, unlike comp code compiled in C++. Um, so yeah, I, th I think I would have used Swift, honestly. Cool. Uh, I just have one follow-up. Uh, you mentioned the memory safety, and then that led to uh, you working on something new. Um, I don't know, did Rust cross your mind that time, maybe? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it was one of the languages that uh, I evaluated when we were looking for uh, new languages to maybe switch to or adopt. Um, I looked at basically all of the existing compiled um, safe languages today, uh, spent a bunch of time learning Swift, a bunch of time learning Rust, and I know that this is not a popular opinion, but I like object-oriented programming. And I think, on some level, we can all admit that whatever you think about object-oriented programming, the web is an object-oriented platform. Um, it is designed around OO concepts. And that can be good, that can be bad, but we're stuck with it. Uh, and I think expressing the code that you want to express in a browser, it's really uh, natural to use an OO-friendly language. 
And um, my feeling about Rust is that it's not OO friendly. It's uh, like OO hostile, I would even say. And that just feels like you have to contort yourself in, in ways that seem unnecessary. Uh, if you have the luxury of, of infinite patience and free time, um, and you're willing to build a new language for the heck of it, then why not try to build a perfect language for the domain? So that's kind of where I ended up. <laughs> but um, the co-creator of the language that um, we're, we're making is, by the way, a Rust core member, team member, or was until recently. So um, there's Rust DNA in the project as well. Cool, thanks. Uh, I have lots of questions, but mm, I, I think it's better if I ask some people here if they have questions. Yeah, I have a question about the timeline slide. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and <laughs> lots of curiosity about it. So I mentioned that you basically grow in three years from a fun project to something which to me sounds massive, like the operating system plus a web browser, which is it's not trivial, at least. Sure. And if I if I was doing this, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I would do, I would have to <laughs> rewrite the whole thing at least a couple of times. So, uh, apparently, you have lots of experience, kind of, which, and you're m <laughs> likely lucky. But still, a question: Did you make big mistakes on that way? Because to me, it looks like you had you had to do lots of stuff, and it was, it would be really like lucky not to do anything wrong in the process i've made a ton of mistakes oh yeah, absolutely um the original implementation of layout was really really bad uh, because i essentially just implemented what i had seen webkit do and what uh, how i thought that, that worked uh, because i'd never worked on layout in webkit i just um uh, worked on other parts of webkit and I had seen patches to layout sometimes, and I thought I understood how it worked. And then that's how I built the first layout uh, in, in our web engine. And it turned out to be really hard to um, extend and to, to improve anything in that way. And it also turns out I did not understand layout in WebKit. Um, and I, I don't now either, but at least I, I spoke to the people working on layout in WebKit, and they told me, oh, well, you're building a new browser? Here's what you should do. You shouldn't do what we did. That's we would never do that again. Uh, and they gave me um, some suggestions, and uh, basically, w which amounted to just read the spec and implement the spec. Uh, so <laughs> that's kind of what we've been doing. It's really good advice, uh, and it's really stupidly obvious, but it didn't occur to me at all at the time that we could do that. <laughs> um, but yes, that's, that's, uh, that was a big mistake. And really, any time that we, there was a spec and we just decided to do something else because let's just do something easier or um, something where we know how to do it instead of having to learn a new way of thinking about it from a spec, um, that was almost always a mistake because we've then had to go back and rewrite this thing to behave like the spec. Um, a recent example of that is uh, fetch. So now we implement um, the fetch primitive from, from the WDGG specs and we're retargeting our web engine to use fetch for fetching images, fetching style sheets, scripts, and um, that is fixing a lot of bugs that we didn't even know we had. Uh, and it's just been really great. Uh, we should have done that earlier. <laughs> um, and if I, if, I, if I think longer, I can think of more mistakes. Those are just some <laughs> obvious ones. <laughs> Okay, um, if I said I wanted to embed libjs for scripting in my application, mm -hmm. uh, what would you tell me? What would I have to do in order to do that? Um, well, I know that there's somebody who already did that. Um, I forget what it was. It was some Minecraft thing or something. There's somebody already who already put it into a game thing. Um, and what you have to do, I guess, is just figure out what is the um, smallest set of dependencies that you would have to bring from us, uh, because we are a fairly tightly integrated kit. Um, we don't use like the C++ standard library. We have our own standard library. We have everything of our own. So um, if you just find like the smallest bounding rect of, of libraries from us that you need, and then you can lift those over and um, 
And then you can look at one of our little sample programs that talk to the JS API and have something up and running pretty quickly. As long as you can compile it, it'll work. Okay. Hey, uh, thanks. Like, uh, first of all, like that's pretty impressive work. Like, and I, I found your YouTube channel like long time ago, and you're doing great. But oh, thank you. I, I was wondering about how deep the Ladybird platform integration is, right? So, like, presumably, LeapJFX does mostly software rendering, and like, do you draw like drone like scroll bars and widgets and all that kind of stuff. Is that right, or do you do anything more like complicated for like? It is. You're basically right. Um, it's a software rasterizer, uh, pretty naive 2D graphics library. Um, we only just recently got nice-looking uh, anti-aliased path filling. Uh, we had really ugly path fills for a long time, and we just all just put up with it. Um, but. Yeah, uh, we, we have a, a graphics library that just contains everything needed for rendering Serenity OS, and then we just took that, brought it with us to Linux, to Mac OS, and um, compiled that there, and we use that. So it doesn't use any kind of GPU stuff. It doesn't uh, call out to platform APIs. Um, the only exception is that we use Qt, but the only thing we do with Qt is uh, we take the finished bitmap of the web page that we rendered with our own stuff, and we put that into a queue image and then put that on the screen. Um, so it's extremely thin. Um, and this is definitely an area um, that we have to do something about, speaking of performance earlier, because we do see in profiles just a lot of time disappearing into stuff like um, painting shadows or uh, anti-aliasing, uh, stuff that you take for granted if you use a mature library that this would be fast, but if you use something that um, we just put together quickly and, and didn't even know how to do, um, we do have those kind of performance problems. But they improve over time. Uh, people are actively picking up random parts and improving them. And I think if we can do something um, that uses the GPU eventually, that would be huge. Uh, there's a little bit of an issue there in that we don't have GPU support on Serenity OS. Not very good one, anyway. Uh, so we've kind of been held back by that uh, in, a, in a sense, because we don't have abstractions on top of a GPU that you might otherwise have. Uh, we have all kinds of abstractions, but nothing good for, for um, accelerated rendering. Um, but um, somewhat recently, people have been Im implementing What's it called? A VirGL, which is like virtual GPU uh, support. VirGPU, maybe it's called. So you can have like a hardware acceleration in QMU or VMware environments. And if we have that, we can build an abstraction. And then we can use that abstraction to put in our browser and one day have really fast GPU stuff. I don't know. We'll get there. There's a, there's a million cool, awesome things like that that we, can't, that we want to do, that we should do, and we will do eventually. It's just, which thing do you do first? Um, that's really the big problem. And um, of course, I, I never mentioned, but like, this is an open source project. Obviously, everybody's welcome to work on it. Uh, if anybody finds any of this interesting or just fun to tinker with, there's always room for more hackers and tinkerers. Um, I think I saw someone, yeah. Hi, Andreas. So Hi, Nico. obviously impressive work. So I was wondering, do you have any time left for Serenity OS now that you have started an endless fun project? A time left for Serenity OS? <laughs> now that you have maybe word. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have infinite time for everything. <laughs> That's very good. So the only problem is I'll die, but I'll deal with that then. That, that brings <laughs> me to my real question. You said in the beginning, um, so real web pages is a focus. So how about media playback? Is media playback? Yeah. Do you have support for media playback? Right. So uh, we got pretty recently um, Tim, uh, our, our friend of the project, Tim, added um, media element, video element, and hooked that up so that we can uh, use those. Of course, those are no fun if you don't have codecs. 
and uh, Gregory, um, who also works on Firefox every now and then, um, wrote a VP9 decoder for us. And now we hooked all those things up so we can play VP9 videos in the browser. And um, he had a cool demo where he downloaded a YouTube video and played the video. So that worked in, in the browser, but we don't have the media source extensions or whatever it's called yet, so we can't actually like play it live on YouTube. But uh, the machinery for playing the video, once we know how to fetch it, that is there. Um, so that's something we're obviously looking forward to, the first YouTube playback. Um, I just realized I should have made a slide about this, because I had a cool first on the way here. Um, <laughs> when I was at the airport, uh, I logged into this um, free Wi-Fi hotspot using Ladybird. Uh, that was pretty sweet. <laughs> sure. Uh, hi. Uh, Hello. You, you mentioned uh, wanting to contribute to, to specs and, and fix bugs there and stuff. And you also mentioned heat testing. There isn't currently a spec with heat testing. And if you don't know too much, you might, uh, you might think it, this is not such a big deal. But like, there's a lot of complications. Uh, some of the stuff that I had to do a bit uh, related to that in Chromium was, uh, what do you do with Biddy? If, and uh, if you uh, if you click on on text and th there's maybe a bit of boundary or something and at the end of the line and stuff and that is co uh, not easy exactly. So have you considered working on a hit testing spec? <laughs> I can't say that I have, <laughs> but I, I've seen the emails where people talk about, hey, why isn't there a hit testing spec? Um, Ah, <laughs> coming soon. Uh, no, it's, uh, I, I sympathize with anybody who complains about this because, um, of course, we had to implement hit testing from scratch with no spec. And I don't think we figured it out just yet how it should work <laughs> because it's definitely not correct all the time. Uh, it is very hard to hit test web pages, especially when you, with uh, stuff like bidirectional text. Of course, we have a great solution for that, which is to just run away. Um, <laughs> but one day, we're going to have to handle bidirectional text better. Um, and we, but we also have to write, like, as you saw, we have the, the uh, libgraphics stuff, which does um, text layout, text rasterization. So we have to like, implement all of that stuff. Um, as well in our open type parser and implement shaping and glyph positioning and yada 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 before we'll even get to worrying about clicking uh, in the right place. Um, but to your question, uh, I don't think I would work on any spec anytime soon because I'm busy trying to implement the specs that exist. Um, however, I will gladly contribute to existing specs and uh, fixing or trying to fix anything I come across that like, oh, this is missing, or um, this is wrong, or whatever. Um, we're trying to be good citizens about that. Um, we can definitely be better. And it's only recently, really, that it's gotten to the point where it feels like maybe the spec is wrong, rather than obviously we're wrong. So uh, we don't have a lot of experience feeling like maybe we're doing it right um, just yet. This is new to us. Yeah, I hope that made sense. <laughs> Do we have? Okay. Hello. So, uh, actually, I have a couple, of, a couple of comments and a couple of questions, but I don't know how much time we still have. But the first of all, it's as everyone has already mentioned, it is extremely. Uh, pleasant to watch, you know, such a uh, community fort growing up from the start. I think I remember uh, the the car talks that you used to have. How, how do you used to call those? Where, co yeah, the community talks that oh, you're yeah, driving yeah. the car and uh, talking about things, uh, not necessarily having a draft schedule of topics to talk about. But what we see about Serenity OS and about the browser now 
the Ladybird browser, is that you are able to engage lots of folks to join the, the and to contribute to the project. And there is a couple of things that I think can help with that. One of the things is that quality is there. So people want to con contribute to something that they find, you know, there's quality here and I'm going to add a little bit here. There is your usage of the YouTube videos that you produce. There is uh, Twitter. But do, do you think there is anything extra other than that to help with engaging all those folks? And that's question number one. And why I mentioned that? We, just before your talk, were watching Dylan's talk about Servo, which is another piece of software another web engine that's out there. It has its own state of completeness. But we, we're still you know, growing up in terms of engaging folks and getting random folks to, OK, there is also Servo to contribute to, and there is Rust as a language to learn and all this stuff. And you've managed that with Serenity OS and with Ladybug. What do you think is kind of secret key about all, all that stuff? What, other than, as I said, quality and your usage of internet, uh, to help other communities to also grow. Maybe you thought of that already, but I just wanted to hear your thoughts about this. Well, I think you kind of answered the question for the most part. Like the, the usage of the internet, as you call it, I think that helps a ton. Um, so many people have started hacking on Serenity OS or on Ladybird. Uh, because they just saw my YouTube videos where I'm working on something and they thought, hey, he screwed up here. I can fix that. Um, and sometimes like there, there would be these people who would comment on my videos, like five videos in a row, like, here's a mistake you made. You made a mistake there. And I would tell them every time, like, can you just make a PR? And eventually they would bend and make a PR. And we converted one person. Uh, <laughs> and I have put out like, over a thousand videos on YouTube. So I've been doing this for a while. It's really consistent. Um, and that has been, I think, like the biggest source of new contributors just coming in that way. And I know that it's not something that's easy to replicate and I don't even know if it would work. Um, but I think if you distill it down, what, what I was really doing was just making a lot of um, content and like regular um, content about the projects I'm working on. So uh, I think you could probably do the same if you write a lot about it, if you write in an, an engaging way, or if you stream, or if you make videos, or uh, make something else, just something where people can follow along um, until, until they develop enough curiosity to try to do something themselves. Um, I don't know, video was just a format that I happened to, to try for that. I, I think you could do it with many other formats. Um, and Probably other people could answer this better than I can, but I, I really think that is sort of the secret sauce because at least that's where I see most people uh, attaching from. And then of course, you can only do you can only do so much to like bring people to you. Then you have to keep them, and for that, that's a whole other thing. Uh, you got to have something fun. If you make something boring and then you make cool videos about it, people are probably not going to stay very long anyway. So it has to be cool to work on. We try to keep it cool. I hope it is. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, that answers. <laughs> One more question. Have you ever done any mapping of who are those folks contributing? Are they like just grad folks or are they, as you said, one of the rest core contributors that, okay, let me, let me help out with these folks there. Have you, have you ever uh, kind of mapped who are those folks contributing? Where are they coming from? Are they from different communities? At this point, or they started with Serenity, so they start clean, and I can, you know, uh, grow with them on the project. Um, I can't say that I've been tracking people too much. I think uh, for anybody in the browser business, we should be careful about tracking. But um, we do have like a volunteer user map where people can put a little pin for themselves, so we can see sort of how the community is spread across the world, and uh, we did find that there are a lot of Germans. Um, <laughs> for whatever reason, uh, Germans are super into open source, I think. Um, always have been. At, when I was working on KDE back in 
the mid 2000s, there are so many Germans, uh, and Germans are great. They just uh, they just love open source, <laughs> and we have a lot of Germans in our open source project too. Um, and it, it's a fairly European project, I guess I would say. It's like if you look at the map, you see a lot of Europeans and uh, a lot of like West Coast Americans, and then dots here and there, but concentrated in the, in the European area. And I think it's a lot of young people, um, probably to do with me using YouTube as the bait uh, to, to get people in. Um, <laughs> you don't get a lot, you don't get that many, you know, older adults watching YouTube. Or maybe you do, I don't know, I don't. My, I, I look at my um, audience demographics sometimes and it says like, male 19 to 34 is 99.9% .9 of my audience. <laughs> so make up that what you will. Um, it's the best I can do with the data I have. Um, I'm tempted to ask how you keep it fun, because you didn't elaborate, but <laughs> I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm going to ask a different question, which is just how has decision making evolved as you've gotten more active con contributions and contributors? Um, so decision making hasn't, we haven't had that many decisions to make because it's fairly clear what we're building, like we're just building a browser and the browser needs all of this functionality and um, for the most part it's kind of obvious what work needs to be done. Um, but there was, a, when the project first started I was the only, it was like a, a repo in my GitHub account um, and eventually I moved it to an organization and eventually, um, I changed the license of the projects to say copyright me to copyright the project or something like that. Um, and eventually, I could no longer deal with the pull request queue, so um, I had to start inviting people to co-maintain the project. And um, eventually, it was too much for two people, and eventually, it was too much for three people, and so on. And um, nowadays, I think there's 10 of us or something like that maintain the project. But um, for the most part, I would say it's just obvious what needs to be done. So people just uh, work on their things that they are interested in. And uh, somehow it just becomes a browser. And it becomes an operating system. And there have been very, very few cases where um, I go in and I say, like, oh, wait a minute. I, I final veto this random thing because I think this is going in the wrong direction. Um, if, I, if I look at my own like uh, number of rejected pull requests out of thousands, I think I've rejected less than 15 ever. Uh, so it's <laughs> we're very accepting of all kinds of ideas that people have. Um, and I've talked about it many times as kind of like a hacker's playground because we don't have releases, we don't have a schedule, we don't have a plan. Uh, people are welcome to come and just enjoy themselves by, by working on um, a serious project, but a fun project. So it's a, it's a little bit unusual. We have one question from Brian. What does your UA string claim to be? My UA string? <laughs> uh, we are honest with our UA string, which uh, bites us in the butt every now and then. Um, so we say that we are Ladybird, uh, LibWeb, and LibJS, and we do have the mandatory like Mozilla slash 5.0 or whatever, because the spec says you have to. Uh, <laughs> but outside of that, we just say who we really are. And there are many websites, even big companies who should know better, like Google, where they just look at your UA string and they just tell you to disappear. Um, I think Google Sign-On, for example, is an, it's something that just doesn't work unless we lie about our UA. Um, and I think for the longest time we thought that we can, we can tell the truth and the internet will get better, but the internet doesn't get better. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're going to try, but we're, we can only do so much with our five active users <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> Um, but I think realistically we're going to have to do something where we have a list of bad servers and what lie to tell them um, because otherwise we can't render 
certain websites. And we prefer, I think, I mean, there's on the web, there's spec correct and there's pragmatic correct. And um, we're going to have to choose the pragmatic option and lie a little bit. Otherwise, we won't have a browser that's usable. But we're going to tell the truth as much as possible. Also, if anyone knows where to complain to Google about this type of stuff. <laughs> they will not accept the complaint. Oh, I'm sure they won't, yeah. But at least I would feel good if I complain. <laughs> OK, one more question from Matrix. What can you recommend to get up on speed with Ladybird and its code? Ooh, um, that's a good question. I guess I would recommend getting the code and building it, and then loading up your favorite website and seeing what happens. And if it doesn't work, which it probably won't, then um, see if you can figure out why it doesn't work, or at least um, isolate something that you can tell, like, oh, this thing doesn't work. And um, once people get into doing that, that, usually one thing leads to another, and before they know it, they are fixing it. Um, so that's what I would suggest. Just try it out. See what happens. Thank you. Do we have more questions here? Cool. All right. Thank you, Andreas, and thank you, everyone who asked questions. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>